science knowledge only adds to the excitement and mystery and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it and eventually, if there's an enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. <laughs> the Chloe Sanctuary hopes to give you insight into the health and happiness of your companion parrots. We hope to help you build happy homes using reliable and proven tools. The best homes are built on a rock-solid foundation. And the best foundation for a happy home is the bedrock of science. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, the scientists who have worked long and diligently to understand our companions, we can reach new heights of understanding. And understanding is the key to success. I think treated, most of these birds have a good prognosis, and I would say in... What does avian veterinary medicine have to tell us about our feathered friends? How can the tools of behavior shaping make our homes happier for us and our companions? Shape. How can we deal with biting, screaming, or other misbehavior? What is it like to live among parrots? Let them roam around about you and share a life with them. Of the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the empowerment of captive parrots and public awareness. Hi, and welcome to Cockatude, Cockatoos with Attitude, episode 92, Motivation. Are you glued to that perch, or can we play? What compels behavior? What is the stimulus, the drive, that leads to a behavior? Results. Consequences. These are the motivators. People work for paychecks, for example. Young children will work for candy. People work or volunteer for recognition or personal satisfaction. And many more kinds of results, consequences. We see this kind of thing going on all around us. It's not as if we didn't know it. We just choose not to pay attention. We choose ignorance. I do. Most of us do. Dogs, cats, or birds all work for the same thing. Results. Consequences. What does this mean for us? When you go into a grocery store, you have a list, either in your hand or in your mind. You don't go to the grocery store to hang out. You're there for a reason, for a result. It may be to stock up on an almost empty refrigerator, to pick up some aspirin to deal with a headache that you woke up with. Perhaps you're buying snacks for the big game tomorrow. You have a reason for your actions. You want a result. You expect certain consequences. You may not be happy that you're going to put down $100 for groceries, draining funds from your bank account, and that you will be shopping rather than playing the latest video game or playing with your bird or watching that movie you wanted to see on Netflix. Yet you're motivated. If you're there to buy food, then perhaps your immediate reward will be chips and dip. Your longer term reward may be that stocked refrigerator. I know I need one right now. I need to go to the grocery store later today. Uh, it's been really hot, so I'm doing these episodes early in the morning. Uh, otherwise, uh, I actually tried to record this episode earlier and uh, yesterday, and it was too hot. And uh, I had to dump the whole thing because I forgot to turn off the air conditioner. So, whether you want a stocked refrigerator, which is a long-term result you're shooting for, or you want to get out to the car and start eating chips and dip before you even get home, <laughs> both are motivating. 
We need food to live, so this is a critical reward. We call this a primary reinforcer. Okay, it's primary because it's 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 built in. All right, it's built into our into our um, mammalian brains. Uh, there are only a few primary reinforcers, um, and as I said, they're built into us. They are innate. Warmth when we are cold. Heat when we are freezing. Just cool air when we come in from the stifling heat, which we've had a lot of that around here lately. 113 <laughs> degrees one day. Ugh. But these are just a few examples. Social acceptance and personal satisfaction are forms of reward we call secondary. Secondary reinforcers, um, we want them, but we can live without them, if need be. Primary reinforcers, like food and water, are essential to remaining alive. And as we're seeing now with some of the, you know, the, the high suicide rates in the United States, I think that social or secondary, which is a social type of, yeah, social reinforcers are a type of secondary reinforcer, okay? It's like the good dog, the dog does something right as you give him a bone. The good dog is the secondary thing, it's the social reinforcer in this case. And the, the doggy bone, the milk bone, is the primary, okay? If they're not, if people aren't being reinforced enough socially, if they're feeling too isolated, then we have this suicide problem. It's unfortunately common in in industrialized societies, and sadly becoming more common. But how can we use this knowledge uh, about reinforcers and motivation to our own benefit? All living things respond to reinforcers. If we can learn what consequences, what results a parrot works for, then we can use that knowledge to help them choose behaviors we want over behaviors we don't want, we don't like. Choosing to step onto our hands rather than biting our fingers. <laughs> Choosing to chew a toy rather than our furniture, choosing to play with us rather than hide from us. On the other hand, we can use motivation also to get our birds to stop doing something. This is a matter of making one behavior more rewarding, more motivating than another. It's like the story of the choice behind two doors. Behind one is a lady, and behind the other is a man eating tiger. In the story, the choice is made blindly. Oh, beautiful song, PHS. You have another verse? Beautiful song. Beautiful song, pretty girl. Pretty girl. What are you doing down there, Pippa? In the, cho in the story, the choice is made blindly. Our job is to paint a clear sign over each door. Okay, these are called cues. Our job is to make clear what result each behavior will bring about. We have to help them understand the consequences, and we don't have language to help us. Oh, yeah, we can use a word or two as cues to what behavior we want. A little while ago, Lorelei, who's asleep, which is funny, they only have, they have hemispheric sleep, so they only sleep on one side of their brain at a time. That's why they seem to wake up so fast. Go along, only half their brain is asleep. But um, if I use the word N-O, I'm not going to say it, I get the attention of, and it's funny, in the room, I'll get the attention of the one who's doing something. Okay, If they're just sitting there, that, that word doesn't have much of an effect. Um, but the one that's actually active, most active, is the one who's going to turn and look at me. And especially if they're in doing something that they've been in that situation before and you've stopped them. Okay. So we can use a word or two as cues to what behavior we want.
But that's not the same as complex language. So what we can't do is provide a concise explanation in English or German or Swahili that they will understand. If you've seen the movie Arrival, you should understand the problem. Language is a big issue in that movie. Okay, We are communicating with alien creatures that talk in ways alien to us. They use feather position, they use body language, and short vocalizations to convey meaning. Right, Pippa? What do you want? You want something. Yeah. You want to get petted? What do you want? Pet? Okay. She seems to re be responding to the social reinforcement here. And yeah, I do think of it that, hey, Laurel, I know. Ah, ah. Um, I do think of it that way. But I don't think about it that way all the time. I'm not running around going, oh, I'm, I'm providing a social reinforcer. Oh, now I'm giving a primary reinforcer. After a while, this becomes just, you, you understand the principles, so the words aren't important. But they have their own way of talking. Like I say, there's feather position, body language, short vocalizations. That's how they can learn meaning. Um, when I was taking American Sign Language years ago, ASL, a deaf woman told me that most of what hearing people say is stupid or untrue. And uh, she was offended. They had come up with a way, some surgically to, to uh, provide hearing to many people who were deaf. And she said she wanted no part of that. Um, the reason she didn't want any part of it is because our language, the language we use, is, uh, is just mostly stupid or untrue. Um, and as she made clear, what matters is what you do, not what you say. Um, a good example is that she was talking about if you ask a deaf person, would you like to go to a movie with me? And you say it, would you like to go to a movie with me? And you don't have any emotion on your face. They aren't going to believe you. But if you're going, would you like to go to a movie with me? Okay. And signing it at the same time. Oh, my signing is gone now. I mean, I can do a few words and I can finger spell and that kind of thing. But... Um, I haven't have been able to practice it. I don't know any deaf people anymore. But um, if you're going like this, yeah, you want to go to a movie? Then they're going to respond. But if you're going, would you like to go to a movie with me? And you're looking away and not paying attention, they're going to figure that you're just, you know, it's just the usual BS coming from a hearing person. Okay? Hey! Don't eat the printer. Okay, you can go up there if you want So what matters is what you do, not what you say. I've seen Cecil and Laura and I pretending to talk like us, and yeah, it's funny. But more importantly, it may show just how silly they think our vocalizations are. They get our body language perfect. You see them, and you see them talking like us, okay? They get the body language just right. Um, it's almost like, oh, what are you doing? It's almost like Saturday Night Live, you know, by birds. Um, what are you doing up there, Pip? That's not a perch. It's not a perch. You're going to fall, probably. Um, so we have a toolkit. It's made of two basic tools, reward and punishment. Uh, things that increase the behavior and things that decrease it. You know, we don't use the same. When we say punishment, we don't mean hitting someone, saying, ow. What we mean is reducing a behavior or extinguishing it, getting rid of it. Okay. Um, both of these are motivating. If I come at you with a stun gun, and I press the button and you see an arc of electricity shoot across the three-quarter inch gap and I start coming at you like this, you're going to be motivated. Okay, I can guarantee that. You're going to be motivated. But it doesn't mean in the future that what I say or do to you is going to be motivating. 
He says, it's all right, baby. She didn't come after you. It's okay. You can drive a parrot toward doing a particular behavior with a rewarding con consequence, a reinforcer. Or you can drive them away with a punishing consequence, lessening a behavior. Okay. It's a little more subtle than the carrot and the stick, but that's the general idea. If I release a hungry tiger into your home, you will be motivated to get the heck out of your house fast, okay? If I offer you a wonderful meal when you're hungry, you will be motivated to sit down to dinner. As finding a tiger in your home or a sumptuous meal when you've been starving, these are both immediately motivating. This is like offering a favorite treat to your parrot when it's hungry. We use this motivation to shape our parents' behaviors. Of course, there's a problem of communicating more complicated behaviors that we want them to do. So we break these desired behaviors into baby steps. Okay? We teach them this little thing and that little thing. We add on to it and progressively. You teach them a behavior a little bit at a time. Then they put it all together and you end up with the behavior you want, the ultimate behavior you want. Sometimes we need to stretch their motivational drive a bit, like Kathy. Speaking of that, um, we can't give them the reward, the reinforcer that they want exactly at the moment. They do the behavior we want. And the key there is you need, to, you need to reinforce what you want at the exact moment. If you have a bird that's stepping up and you wait until it's sitting on your hand for a second and then you reward it, you're rewarding it for sitting on your hand. You want to get them just as they're putting that foot down on your hand. Reward them right then. If you wait until they're sitting, then you're rewarding them for sitting. We have a when we're training people to two train birds, one of the things we do is put a blindfold on one of the people in the room. Now, one of the things we do is we have one person in the room become the bird and one person become a bird trainer. Okay. The bird responds to snapping of the fingers or, uh, you know, making a click sound or saying good bird. And you, you want something like you're going to open the door. Okay, you, you, you get together in secret while the, the bird is out of the room and you decide we're going to have them open the door. So they come in, they start, oh, the only rule they have is that they have to move around a little bit. Okay, because if they're just standing still, you couldn't do anything. So they're moving around a little bit. When they're facing in the right direction, you snap your fingers or you say good bird. And when, then when they start walking forward, if they're going in the right direction, you say good bird. If they're not, you don't say anything. And what happens is you can see how... If you don't reinforce it at just the right time, they're going to do the wrong thing. And it's exactly the same with these guys, okay? It's exactly the same. Peaches is an amazing personality. Her daily maintenance requires dedication and mindfulness. She requires two forms of medicine, seven course meals, and effort to entice her to eat. Extensive preening in every day, special tools to trim nails, constant attention to her vocalizations, daily walks, and twice yearly checkups due to the possibility of impacted feather follicles and the nature of her spinal injuries. It seems a common misconception among the general public that parrots are like toys in a toy box. Nothing could be further from the truth. They are complex creatures. Recently, scientific studies have shown them to be at least as intelligent as chimpanzees. Every captive parrot needs special humans who will dedicate themselves to understanding them, those who know their species as it lives in the wild, special people that understand their social, mental, and physical needs. They need to be understood for what they are, and not as merely human companions, as circus performers to bring smiles. Peaches needs all this and more. She is our special girl. Will you help us care for Peaches? Please make a donation today at our website, chloesanctuary.org. 
That's spelled C-H-L-O-E-S-A-N-C-T-U-A-R-Y dot O-R-G. As a special thank you for your donation, we will joyfully send you a postcard with Peach's happy face. Um, since they can't speak our language, we must make it clear to them some way that they've earned their reward. So we call this a bridge. A bridge is a phrase, such as good bird, that lets them know exactly what they did and, and what, exactly what they did that we wanted and what they will get in return for it. It's like the sound of the jackpot at the casino before the money falls into the hopper. Okay. If you didn't get the money or the ringing bell, how would you know you won the jackpot? There's a method we use in ABA called a motivating operation. This is where we create a scenario that makes getting the behavior we want more likely. For example, your Uncle Bob won't leave his little chihuahua home when he comes to visit. He's always bringing that little ankle biter along. Max the macaw doesn't react well to this little monster in the town because the dog yaps at him for five minutes every time he arrives. <laughs> so, you have a plan. Using ABA on your uncle, all right, and the dog. Your uncle shows up. You hand him a beer right outside. You walk out the door, you hand him a beer, and you close the door, okay? You're not letting him in with his dog. The beer is the reinforcer for your Uncle Bob, okay? To keep him outside. Then you open the side gate and you go in the backyard with his little Weasley dog, Huffy. So, now you're in the backyard, you have a big toy box of doggy toys, and you encourage Huffy, who just loves to fetch, to chase the ball for half an hour. While you talk to Bob, handing him more beer from the cooler, and listening to him gripe about his wife again. Now, when Huffy is huffing and puffing and barely able to fetch, <laughs> you just have to get Steve, don't you? One way or another, Pippa has to get Steve. <laughs> so, when Huffy is barely able to fetch, panting, tongue hangs out of his mouth, you open the back sliding door and let them both in. Now, the motivating operation, what it does is that you have motivated that dog. You think, well, how am I motivated? It's just tired. It's now motivated to go and sit on the little doggy bed you have for Huffy, because you know he's going. Bob's going to keep bringing him over, that instead of barking his head off, he's going to go plop down over by the water dish. He's thirsty, there's no water outside, runs over, gets to the water dish, starts drinking. Then there's the, the little doggy bed. He hops on that, and next to it is dog bones. Okay? So he sits there, tired, and then kind of wakes up a little bit after a while. Like, oh, dog bones. He starts eating those. Pippa, you're, you're something else, kid. I don't know what to say. You're something else. Just hang in there. Um... So the motivation, motivating operation. Hey, bah, you silly bird! You successfully tired out the dog and changed his motivations and his drive. Okay. Another important thing to dealing with motivation is to consider the other things in the envi environment that drive behavior. We who train others try to limit the number of distracting stimulations in the place where we train. I once paid for a volunteer to get training with Dr. Friedman when she was in town in San Diego. Unfortunately, my volunteer was more interested in the women who attended than the subject being taught. He's an old dog. So my efforts were lost on him. Consider all the distractions in the environment. 
anyone trying to train Chloe on a can of Rumford baking powder was in view, would find the task impossible. She would screech until you put the can away and ignore you the whole time. Behavior is a function of its consequences. Motivation is the key to engaging a bird to change its behavior. Hi, I'm Don, the executive director of the Chloe Sanctuary and producer of Cockatude. I want to thank all of you for watching our videos. Pippa, are you having fun? You want to get up on the shoulder there, girl? I've been trying to come up with a way to provide higher quality videos and also reward our patrons. So now we have a paid account at Vimeo where we can post high quality, high resolution episodes. Right? Tell them all about it. Tell them all about it. Our patrons are the ones who are helping us pay for this upgrade, so only patrons will be able to see our new full episodes. Our YouTube videos will be about half as long as they were before. Pippa, the gang, and I would like to invite you to become a patron at patreon.com slash Chloe Sanctuary. Just a single dollar an episode, we do two a month, will get you full access to these enhanced episodes. Right, Pippa? Yeah, Pippa agrees. Yeah. Pippa's news, Peach's training tips, and Cecil's cool stuff found will only be on these new enhanced videos. Pippa wants you to know that she works very hard coming up with all the things for her segment, and she wants you to see them. She hopes she will join us on Patreon. Our patrons deserve the best, and we're hoping to give that to them with this new video platform. You can check out an example of the higher quality by going to chloesanctuary.org and clicking on the Cockatude tab on the top of the page. I also plan to upload video shorts on weeks where we don't do a new episode. There'll be lots of stuff inside the aviary, that kind of thing. Right, Pippa? Some behind-the-scenes stuff around here, too. Right? Beak trimming and stuff like that. Yeah, little stuff. So fly out to patreon.com slash Chloe Sanctuary and join right now. We hope to see you there for the upcoming episode. Don't we, Pippa? <laughs> yeah, we do, don't we? We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. To science, knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower.